Okay, we are live on Facebook. And then I think we're ready to start. One second. Here we go. <clears throat> okay. I think everybody can hear us. Yeah. Okay. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Gopi Janabalaba Kiri Varadha Gopi Janabalaba Kiri Vadadha Guti Vishodananda Vrajajana Ranjana Vishodananda Vrajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihari Gopi Janabalaba Kiri Varadha Gopi Gopi Janabalaba Giri Varodha Gudi Yashoda Nanda Navarajit Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nanda Navarajana Danjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radhamad Uhuva Kunya Bihari Jaya Radha Mad Uva Kunya Bihari Jaya Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Paravitacharya Also Tara Sintashi Shimad His Divine Grace Vaya Chanana the Bhaktivananda Goswami Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Iskan founder Acharya, Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Ananta Koti Vaishnavrinda ki jai, Namacharya, Shila Hoidas Thakur ki jai, Brahm Zai Kaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Siddhwe Dikaratha, Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopikopana, Shayam Kuti Radha Kunda, Giri Govardhan ki jai, Vrindavanam ki jai, Maturam ki jai, Jagadatha Sami ki jai, Yamunamai ki jai, Shimadhi Vlasi Devi ki jai, Samaveda Bhakta Vrindhi ki jai, Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Go. All glories, the assembled devotees, all glories, the assembled devotees, all glories, the assembled devotees, all glories to Shi Guru and Gauranga, Shila Prabhupada. Jai, Maom Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhuble, Shimati Bhakta Vedanta Swamati Namani Namaste, Saraswati Devi Gorvada Vajani Nivsesha Srinivadi, Paschacha Teja Taran Me. So, Omaganat Himiranda Shaganan Janash Lakya Chakshur Unmeditam Yena Tasmai Shigurve Maha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So we're going to start the Nectar Devotion Study. And first we chant the prayer from the Goswami Ashtaka, written by Srinivas Acharya. Nana Shastra Vicharan Kanipano Sadharma Samstapako Lukanam Hitakarano Tri Bhuvane 
Manyo Shadhanya Karo Radha Krishna Padara Vinda Vajana Nantena Mataliko Vande Rupa Sanatano Raghu Yago Shri Jiva Gopala Karo Okay, and the translation. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, namely Sri Sanatan Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, hmm. uh, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing <coughs> eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds, and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. So, we're continuing our study of the bhavas again. So remember, we are on the Yavachari bhavas. Let's share the screen. And just to reiterate, as I do in the beginning of each of these classes about the bhavas, there's vibhavas, which means that which stimulates your emotions. And there's anubhavas, the action you take in relationship to the stimulation, your voluntary action you take in relation to the stimulation. There's as the sattvic bhava, the eightfold emotions that are actually constantly part of your identity, but sometimes they're manifest, sometimes they're not manifest. There's the Vyabhachari Bhavas, which we're reading about now, which are the intermittent ecstatic emotions that overtake you and you have no control over. And then finally, there's the Stai Bhava, <coughs> or Stai Bhavas, which relate to the constant relationship that one has with the Lord, such as Dasha, servitude, uh, Sakya, friendship, uh, Vatsaya, parental, and Madhurya, Conjugal. Okay, so now we're reading some of the Vyabhachari Bhavas. The Vyabhachari Bhavas are sometimes called to uh, Sanchari Bhavas, it's just a synonym. Uh, violence. When Krishna was fighting with the Kaliya snake by dancing on his head, Kaliya bit Krishna on the leg. At that time, Guru became infuriated and began to murmur, Krishna is so powerful that simply by his thundering voice, the wives of Kaliya. I've had miscarriages. Because my Lord has been insulted by this snake, I wish to devour him immediately, but I cannot do so in the presence of my Lord because he may become angry with me. This is an instance of eagerness to act in ecstatic love as a result of dishonor to Krishna. When Shishupal objected to the worship of Krishna in the Rajasuya sacrifice or Rajasuya arena, at a sacrifice organized by Maharaj Yudhisthira, Sahadev, the younger brother of Arjuna, said, A person who cannot tolerate the worship of Krishna is my enemy and is possessed of a demoniac nature. Therefore, I wish to strike my left foot upon his broad head just to punish him more strongly than the wand of Yamaraj. Then Baladev began to lament like this, O oh, all auspiciousness to Lord Krishna! I am so surprised to see that the condemned descendants of the Kuru dynasty, who so unlawfully occupy the throne of the Kuru kingdom, are criticizing Krishna with diplomatic devices. Oh, this is intolerable. This is another instance of eagerness caused by dishonor to Krishna. So, I guess I should tell a little bit of the story. So there's the... Uh, <clears throat> Rajasuya's sacrifice that was uh, conducted by Maharaj Yudhisthira in a place called Indraprastha. Now, originally Maharaj Yudhisthira was living in Hastinapur, which is pretty close to Indraprastha. And what happened is that he had his cousin brothers, there were a hundred of his cousin brothers who were really envious of him, and they just couldn't get along or tolerate that Yudhisthira Maharaj was actually the uh, prince who was supposed to take over the kingdom as soon as the king 
passed away or went and took sannyas. They couldn't tolerate it, and so it was an intolerable situation having everybody live together with cousins, brothers. Therefore, it was decided that Maharaj Yudhisthira and his brothers, Nakula, uh, Sahadev, Arjuna, and Bhimsen, would have a separate kingdom. In other words, they divide the kingdom between the cousin brothers. So the decision was that they would go to Indra Prashta, which is right near Hastinapur, and that would be their kingdom. So when they went to Indra Prasa, they discovered it was a desert. But by the mercy of Krishna and the mercy even of Maya Donava, who constructed the assembly house there, it became an amazing place. And Yudhisthira and Maharaj uh, got the support of all the kings around the world. So he was conducting the Rajasuya sacrifice. The Rajasuya sacrifice is conducted by someone who is an emperor, not just a king, can only be conducted by one person who's on the planet. After he does it, no one else can do the righteous sacrifice because you can only have one emperor. And so, therefore, as he was conducting this sacrifice, there was also the killing of Shishupal, who was envious. But apart from that, Shishupal had his uh, supporters who were tacitly agreeing with him. Tacitly means they didn't say anything, but they also didn't stop him. And those supporters were the cousin brothers of Yudhisthira Maharaj. That is Duryodhana, Dushishan, Vikarna, and the other 97 brothers. So, uh, therefore, Balaram was lamenting, you know, why isn't anyone trying to stop this ridiculous stuff? So he was really angry at the whole Kuru dynasty. So next one is haughtiness resulting in dishonorable words. In the Vidagda Madhava, Jatila, the mother-in-law of Radharani, began to criticize Krishna in this way. Krishna, you are standing here. And Radharani, who has just been married to my son, is also standing here. Now I know both of you very well. So why should I not be very anxious to protect my daughter-in-law from your dancing eyes? This is an instance of dishonorable words used to indirectly criticize Krishna. Of course, Jutila, or Jatila, sorry. Jatila is actually a great devotee of Krishna, and so is Kutila, her daughter. Even they, though they appear to act in opposition to Krishna and as far as Krishna's activities with Srimadhi Radharani, but this is a service to Krishna to sort of stir up all these different emotional exchanges and suspicion and all these romantic affairs that you'll read about or when you get more advanced in the Vidagda Madhava and other literatures. Similarly, some of the gopis once began to address Krishna with these dishonorable words. My dear Krishna, you are a first-class thief, so please leave this place immediately. We know you love Chandravali more than us, but there is no use in praising her in our presence. Kindly do not contaminate the name of Radharani in this place. This is another instance of dishonorable words cast upon Krishna in ecstatic love. So, the Vibhav in this particular case would be Krishna's dalliance with Chandravali who is Radharani's so-called competitor? Of course, no one is Radharani's so-called competitor or any type of competitor. Radharani expands herself as Chandravali and the other principal gopis, even the ones that appear to be in opposition to Radharani. Uh, just like Krishna arranges for different devotees, like Jatila and Jatila, uh, to appear to be in opposition to him and his ecstatic pastimes for Srimati Radharani. So in the same way, uh, Radharani expands herself as Chandravali and her associates in order to spice up the relationship so there's sometimes anger, sometimes dishonorable words, which is being described here. So anyway, and Krishna loves this. He loves this anger. He loves to mm, pacify Radharani afterwards, and he takes so many different guises in order to pacify Radharani. Sometimes he has to dress in drag which means he dresses as a woman. 
sometimes he has to just bow down and cry at her lotus feet. Sometimes he has to make believe he's a snake charmer so that he can cure Radharani, who has apparently been bitten by a snake, but actually she hasn't. Anyway, uh, there is another statement in the 10th canto, 31st chapter, verse 16 of Srimad Bhagavatam. When all the gopis came out of their homes to meet Krishna in the Vrindavana forest, Krishna refused to accept them and asked them to go home, giving them some moral instruction. At that time, the gopis spoke as follows. Dear Krishna, there's extreme distress in being out of your presence, and there's extreme happiness simply in seeing you. Therefore, we have all left our husbands, relatives, brothers, and friends, and have simply come to you being captivated by the sound of your transcendental flute. O oh, infallible one, you would better know the reason for our coming here. In plain words, we are here simply because we have been captivated by the sweet sound of your flute. We are all beautiful girls, and you are so foolish that you are rejecting our association. We do not know anyone other than yourself who would miss this opportunity to associate with young girls in the dead of night. This is another instance of indirect insults used against Krishna in ecstatic love. Of course, as we mentioned before, when Krishna played his flute, and all the young girls, the gopis, they dropped everything, left their families, left their children, left their cookies, whatever, their husbands, and they went to join Krishna. One of the first things that Krishna said, why are you here? Better you go home. This is not proper for you to be here. Take care of your husbands. This is dharma. He started to preach dharma to them. And they would hear nothing of it, and they got angry with Krishna. Envy. In the Padyavali, one of the friends of Radharani once addressed her thus, My dear friend, please do not be too puffed up because Krishna has decorated your forehead with his own hand. It may be that Krishna is yet attracted by some other beautiful girl. I see that the decoration on your forehead is very nicely made, and so it appears that Krishna was not too disturbed in painting it. Otherwise, he could not have painted such exact lines. This is an instance of envy caused by Radha's good fortune. So this is basically teasing. It's not like, as I mentioned before, the hateful envy we find in this world. And it's quite humorous <clears throat> because if someone is completely bewildered or in love with someone else, they're not going to be able to be painting such precise lines anywhere, especially on the other person's body. The forehead. In the 10th canto, 30th chapter, verse 30, of Srimad Bhagavatam, there's the following statement. When the gopis were searching for Krishna and Radha after the rasa dance, they thus began to speak among themselves. We have seen the footprints of Krishna and Radha on the ground of Vrindavan, and they are giving us great pain, because although Krishna is everything to us, that girl is so cunning that she has taken him away alone and is enjoying his kissing without sharing him with us. This is another instance of envy of the good fortune of Srimati Radharani. <laughs> this is really nectarian. Nectarian. Sometimes when the coward boys used to play in the forest of Vrindavan, Krishna would play on one side and Balaram would play on another. There would be competition and mock fighting between the two parties. And when Krishna's party was defeated by Balaram, the boys would say, if Balaram's party remains victorious, then who in the world can be weaker than ourselves? This is another instance of envy and ecstatic love. Again, you have the chivalrous competition, uh, this teasing, this actually denigration even of oneself. <laughs> so everything's there in the spiritual world. In other words, you're not going to miss anything if you go to the spiritual world or if you love Krishna, you dedicate your life to Krishna. You're not going to miss anything. The only thing you're going to miss is pavarga. What is pavarga? Pa ma, parishrama, parishrama, bhaya, mrityu, uh, hard work, foaming at the mouth, fainting. Shoo. So much over endeavor in this world, and finally, mrityu, death. That's the only thing you'll miss. I mean, I wouldn't mind missing those things.
impudence. In the 10th canto, 52nd chapter, verse 41 of Srimad Bhagavatam, Rukmini addresses a letter to Krishna as follows. My dear, unconquerable Krishna, my marriage day is fixed for tomorrow. I request that you come to the city of the Dharva without advertising yourself. Then have your soldiers and commanders suddenly surround and defeat all the strength of the king of Mogadha. And by thus adopting the methods of the demons, please kidnap and marry me. So I, I think, oh yeah, Prabhupada explains it here, and I'll explain it further. According to the Vedic system, there are eight kinds of marriages, one which is called the Rakshasa Vivaha. Rakshasa Vivaha refers to kidnapping a girl and marrying her by force. This is considered to be a demoniac method. <laughs> when Rukmini was going to be married to Sishapal by the choice of her elder brother, she wrote the above letter to Krishna requesting him to kidnap her. This is an instance of impudence and ecstatic love for Krishna. So, anyway, there's different types of marriage according to the Vedic system, among Kshatriyas at least. And uh, the normal type, the Vivaha Yoga, is just when you make the arrangement and parents make the arrangement that someone is going to marry someone else, or, uh, or yeah, that, that's one arrangement, Vivaha Yoga, and uh, they get married, invite everybody. Another one is the Swayamvara. Swayamvara basically means that the girl chooses her own after seeing her different suitors. That means the men. Suitors mean not the people who wear suits. means the men who come to try to win her over. So the different suitors will come and they'll do some competition or they'll display themselves or puff up their muscles or whatever, you know, their smiles or whatever. And the girl will actually choose. That's called the Swayamvara. And another type is the Gandharva marriage. That's very oh, romantic. Where the boy and the girl meet. And they think, boy, why should we take all this trouble of holding a whole big ceremony and sending out the invitations, spending money on the guests? You know, let's just get married right, in that, right away. That's impetuous. And they exchange garlands, and therefore, they're married. And that's happened in a number of cases, like with uh, Shantanu and Ganga Devi. That's a story from the Mahabharata. King Shantanu was wandering along the banks of the Ganges, and the personification of the Ganges came out. That's Ganga Devi. And he looked at her and he said, Wow, will you marry me? And she said, Only under the condition that you never disagree with me. If you disagree with me, I'm out of here. So he said, sure thing, let's get married. And they exchanged garlands, and that was it. There's so many instances of that type of marriage. And the Rakshasa marriage is really interesting. It's where a man goes to the woman's house, usually in secret, and grabs her and rides off on a horse or in a chariot or in a Tesla, something like that. <laughs> And kidnaps her. And she agrees, of course. It's not a question that she just like can't do anything about it. Of course, sometimes Rakshasas do force themselves upon the ladies, and but they really wait until the lady voluntarily agrees. And I'll give you a practical example of a real Rakshasa. His name was a good friend of mine, Ravana. Ravana used to travel all over the three worlds on his Pushpaka Vimana. Pushpaka Vimana means a flower airplane. Not like the 747, 737, or whatever. 787, that's my favorite plane. And uh, he would kidnap girls, young girls. And they would become his wives. Of course, he had a curse. That was uh, Nalakuvara actually one time gave him a curse that he shouldn't or couldn't force himself upon any lady. And if he ever tried to do that, then guess what? He would die. Because Ravana at one particular juncture uh, attacked or let's say raped Ramba, who is Nalakuvara's wife. So it was really bad that he did that. 
So anyway, so but then after that, everybody accepted Ravana willingly, even when he kidnapped them unwillingly after they saw him and saw his opulence and his handsomeness. There's practically not a girl in the three worlds who would not accept Ravan, even though he is a Rakshasa and probably for dinner you had, uh, I hate to say, human flesh. But anyway, because he was so powerful, rich, famous, and you see that. I mean, I see that so many times when there's a powerful, rich, famous guy. Then, even though the guy is like 85 years old and ugly as a prune with eyes on him, he's able to marry or have a young girl who's like 20-something years old fall in love with him. Yuck. And, of course, she's thinking, uh, when is he going to die? I get the money. What a good deal. Yeah, I live with him for two or three years. Then he's gone. Anyway, so that's a real Rakshasa marriage. But there are sometimes Rakshasa marriages done by people who are not Rakshasas. Now, Krishna is definitely not a Rakshasa. <laughs> he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But he kidnapped Rukmini. And there's nothing wrong with that. And also, he had Arjuna kidnap his sister, not Arjuna's sister, but Krishna's sister, Subhadra, right before Subhadra was supposed to marry Duryodhana. Arjuna just like grabbed her, and she wanted to go with him, obviously. <laughs> and he married her. So that sort of Rakshasa marriage is bona fide under certain circumstances where the girl agrees, not against the girl's will, but it's actually quite romantic. And usually when Kshatriyas got married, they had to fight off the other suitors. That means the guys who wanted to marry the person whom they are marrying uh, were there with all sorts of arms, you know, like bows and arrows, or nowadays I guess it would be like uh, machine guns, <laughs> submachine guns. Anyway, so that's a bona fide Vedic tradition. So generally, we don't advise the devotees to do that. It's better they're careful and do some astrology before the marriage, get people's permission before the marriage. But in certain cases, you know, just kidnap and don't let your parents know about it. Don't let her parents know until you're married. And you have grandchildren or children. One of the gopis said, they have grandchildren. One of the gopis said, may Krishna's sweet flute be washed away by the waves of the Yamuna and let us fall into the ocean. The sweet sound of that flute is so impudent that it makes us lose all composure before our superiors. Wow. Dizziness. Every evening at sunset, Krishna used to return from the pasturing ground when he herded cows. Sometimes when Madhya Shoda could not hear the sweet vibration of his flute, she would become very anxious, and because of this, she would feel dizzy. Thus, dizziness caused by anxiety and ecstatic love for Krishna is also possible. When Yashoda had tied Krishna up one time, she began to think, Krishna's body is so soft and delicate. How could I have tied him with rope? Thinking this, her brain became puzzled, and she felt Dizziness. The gopis were advised by their superiors to bolt the doors at night, but they were so carefree, they did not carry out this order very rigidly. Sometimes, by thinking of Krishna, they became so confident of being out of all danger that they would lie down at night in the courtyards of their houses. This is an instance of dizziness and ecstatic love due to natural affection for Krishna. It may be questioned why devotees of Krishna should be attacked by dizziness, which is usually considered a sign of the mode of ignorance. To answer this question, Srila Jiva Goswami has said that the devotees of Lord Krishna are always transcendental to all the modes of material nature. When they feel dizziness or go to sleep, they are not considered to be sleeping under the modes of nature, but are accepted as being in a trance of devotional service. There is an authoritative statement in the Garuda Purana about mystic yogis 
who are under the direct shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In all three stages of their consciousness, namely wakefulness, dreaming, and deep sleep, the devotees are absorbed in thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, in their complete absorption and thought of Krishna, they do not sleep. That is why when we talk about a great devotee, spiritual master, great personality, we do not use the word sleep. But sleep means ignorance. We use the word resting. I know. Resting. That Guru Maharaj is resting right now. If you say he's sleeping, that means he's in ignorance. So he's resting. Okay? And that's how you can tell if you are a great devotee or not, of course. If you think you're a great devotee, you ain't a great devotee. But at least you can tell if you're making progress by what you think about, dream about, do in your sleep. Most people, when they're sleeping, they go somewhere else and forget all about their devotional service. During the day, they may be chanting and dancing and having a good old time in Krishna consciousness. But then at night, whatever happens, happens. They go to the bars, they vote in the elections. <laughs> anyway, that's how you can see if you're making progress. What happens at night when you are resting? Once Lord Valade began to talk in his sleep, the country rest, uh, as follows, O lotus-eyed Krishna, your childhood adventures are manifest simply according to your own will. Therefore, please immediately dispose of the stubborn pride of this Kaliya serpent. By saying this, Lord Valadev astonished the assembly of the others and made them laugh for some time. Then, yawning so hard as to make ripples in his abdomen, Lord Valadev, the bearer of the plow, returned to his deep sleep. This is an instance of sleepiness and ecstatic love. <laughs> so when you're able to dream of Krishna and you're talking to Krishna, then you know you've made spiritual advancement, alertness. A devotee once stated, I have already conquered the mode of ignorance, and I am now on the platform of transcendental knowledge. Therefore, I shall be engaged only in searching after the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is an instance of alertness and ecstatic love. Transcendental alertness is possible when the illusory condition is completely overcome. At that stage, when in contact with any reaction of material elements, such as sound, smell, touch, or taste, the devotee realizes the transcendental presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In this condition, the ecstatic symptoms, that is, standing of the hair on the body, rolling of the eyeballs, and getting up from sleep are persistently visible. Now, here's an instance. One uh, when Srimati Radharani first saw Krishna, she suddenly became conscious of all transcendental happiness and the functions of her different limbs were stunned. When Lalita, her constant companion, whispered into her ear the holy name of Krishna, Radharani immediately opened her eyes wide. This is an instance of alertness caused by hearing the sound of Krishna's name. So when I was a brahmachari many years ago, that's how I would wake people up in the ashram. Because as I began my management as what was a temple commander or something like that, uh, I would go around the brahmachari ashram and say, wake up, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And sometimes I would play cartels by the poor brahmachari's ears to wake them up. And sometimes if they didn't get up, I would drag their sleeping bags with them inside into the shower and turn on the water. <laughs> anyway, those are the good old days. One day in a joking mood, Krishna informed Radharani, my dear Radharani, I'm going to give up your company. Upon saying this, he immediately disappeared and because of this, Radharani became so afflicted that the hue of her body changed and she immediately fell down upon the ground of Vrindavan. She had practically stopped breathing but when she smelled the flavor of the flowers on the ground, she awoke in ecstasy and got up. This is an instance of transcendental alertness caused by smelling. Now, one thing is the flowers on the ground had been offered 
to Krishna, they were prasadam, obviously, and they had been warned by Krishna, and they came from the conjugal relationship of Radha and Krishna when they embraced each other, so that was an impetus uh, of Ibal. When Krishna was touching the body of one gopi, the gopi addressed her companion thus, My dear friend, whose hand is this touching my body? I had become very afraid after seeing the dark forest on the bank of Yamuna, but suddenly the touch of his hand has saved me from hysterical fits. This is an instance of alertness caused by touching. One of the gopis informed Krishna, My dear Krishna, when you disappeared from the arena of the rasa dance, our most dear friend, Radharani, immediately fell on the ground and lost consciousness. But after this, when I offered her some of your chewed betel nut remnants, she immediately returned to consciousness with jubilant symptoms in her body. This is an instance of alertness caused by tasting. One night, Shimati Radharani was talking in a dream. My dear Krishna, she said, please do not play any more jokes upon me. Please stop, and please don't touch my garments either. Otherwise, I shall inform the elderly persons, and I shall disclose all of your naughty behavior. While she was talking like this in a dream, she suddenly woke and saw some of her superiors standing before her. Thus, Radharani became ashamed and bowed her head. This is an instance of alertness after awaking from sleep. Wow. Sound from the spiritual world. There's another instance of this. A messenger from Krishna came to Srimati Radharani while she was sleeping, and Radharani immediately awakened. Similarly, when Krishna began to blow on his flute in the night, all the gopis, the beautiful daughters of the coward men, immediately got up from their sleep. This is a very beautiful comparison made in this connection. Well, there is. The lotus flower is sometimes surrounded by white swans, and sometimes it is surrounded by black wasps who are collecting its honey. When there's a thundering in the sky, the swans go away, but the black wasps stay to enjoy the lotus flowers. Hmm. The gopi's sleeping condition is compared to the white swans, and the sound of Krishna's flute is compared to a black wasp. When Krishna's flute sounded, the white swans, which represent the sleeping condition of the gopis, were immediately vanquished, and the black wasp sound of the flute began to enjoy the lotus flower of the gopi's beauty. Wow. Okay. So then we go on to the next chapter, which is also going to deal with uh, more symptoms of Yavachari Bhavas. Let me just... We are making a lot of progress. We're going to finish Nectar Devotion quite quickly. Yes, we can. Let me see how far we got to go for additional symptoms. Chapter 31. Well, this chapter is kind of short. We'll finish it tomorrow, but we'll start today. Chapter 31. Uh, additional symptoms. Okay. All the previously mentioned 33 symptoms of ecstatic love are called Vyavachari, or disturbing. That's what Vyavachari means. All these symptoms refer to apparently disturbed conditions, but even in such disturbed conditions, there is acute ecstatic love for Krishna. These symptoms, however, can be divided into three groups. First class, second class, and third, I mean third class. There are many disturbing symptoms in ecstatic love, such as envy, anxiety, pride, jealousy, conclusion, cowardliness, forgiveness, impatience, hankering, regret, doubtfulness, and impudence. These are included in the 33 conditions of ecstatic love. Srila Rupa Goswami has very nicely analyzed the different kinds of disturbing symptoms, and although it is very difficult to find the exact English equivalents for many Sanskrit words used here, his analysis will now be presented. This is extremely interesting, this chapter. When one becomes malicious upon seeing another's advancement in life, his state of mind is generally called envy. 
When one becomes frightened at seeing a lightning bolt in the sky, that fearfulness brings on anxiety. Therefore, fearfulness and anxiety may be taken as one. One's desire to hide his real mentality is called a redoubt, or concealment, and a desire to exhibit superiority is called pride. Both of these may be classified under pretension. In a pretentious attitude, both the of a ball and pride are to be found. One's inability to tolerate an offense committed by another is called amasha, and one's inability to tolerate the opulence of another is called jealousy. Jealousy and amasha are both caused by intolerance. One's ability to establish the correct import of a word may be called uh, conclusiveness, and b before such a conclusive determination of import, there must be thoughtful consideration. Therefore, the act of consideration is present during the establishment of a conclusion. When one presents himself as ignorant, his attitude is called humility. And when there is absence of enthusiasm, it is called cowardice. Therefore, in humility, there is sometimes cowardice also. This is a little psychological analysis. When the mind is steadfast, it is called enduring. And when one's ability to tolerate others' offenses is and one's ability to tolerate others' offenses is called endurance. Therefore, forgiveness and endurance can be synonymous. That's true. Anxiousness for time to pass is called impatience. And when one sees something wonderful, one is said to be struck with wonder. Impatience may be caused by being struck with wonder. And so impatience and being struck with wonder can be synonymous. <laughs> when anxiety is in its dormant stage, it is called hankering. Therefore, anxiety and hankering can also be synonymous. When one becomes regretful for some offense, his feeling is called bashfulness. In this way, bashfulness and regret can be synonymous. Doubtfulness is one of the aspects of argument. After exhibiting impudence, one becomes restless. Impudence, one becomes restless. Therefore, restlessness and impudence can be synonymous. When all such symptoms are uh, included in ecstatic love, they are called sunshiri, or continuously existing ecstatic symptoms. All these symptoms are transcendental and they are exhibited in different ways, acting and interacting under different conditions. They are like the reciprocation of love between the lover and the lover, the beloved. When a person is envious and or defamed, there may be a change in the color of the body. This may be classified as vibhava or sub-ecstasy. Sometimes illusion, collapse, and strong anxiety are also considered to be bibhava. There's different definitions of the word bibhava. When there are many such symptoms, they can simply be grouped together under ecstatic love. Srila Rupa Goswami says that fright, sleep, fatigue, laziness, and the madness of intoxication are sometimes grouped under continuous symptoms of ecstatic love, and they are due to strong attraction. False argument. Determination, steadiness, remembrance, joyfulness, ignorance, humility, and unconsciousness are also different symptoms of ecstatic love. Dependence is also grouped under ecstatic love, and this can be divided into superior dependence and inferior dependence. The direct differentiations between superior and inferior dependence are ascertained by Rupa Goswami and will be presented in due course. So that's the philosophy. I know it's very difficult to understand try to at least enjoy these different pastimes that are being elaborated on by Sri Rupa Goswami and translated by his Divine Grace Shil Prabhupada. One gopi exclaimed, oh, I cannot see the district of Mathura. Even though by simply hearing the name of Mathura, the hairs of my body are standing up, I cannot see the place. So what is the use of my eyes? This statement reveals a strong anxiety to see the district of Mathura, resulting from a strong attachment to Krishna. There's another instance of this strong attachment for Krishna expressed by Bhima when he began to murmur, my arms are just like thunderbolts, but despite these arms, I could not smash Sisupal, Shishupal, while he was blaspheming Krishna. Therefore, of what use are these strong arms? In this instance, Bhima became angry, and being influenced by such anger, his hopelessness became a cause for strong attachment to Krishna. This instance can be described as strong attachment for Krishna and anger. So just enjoy these different pastimes here. Uh, you don't really have to understand all these different designations and uh, categories and subcategories and stuff like that. It's not necessary in order to go back to Godhead. 
what this shows Rupa uh, Goswami's great erudition in analyzing the different moods and pastimes uh, of Krishna and his devotees. When Arjuna witnessed the universal form of Krishna, whose dazzling teeth were practically devouring the very existence of the universe, Arjuna's mouth became dried up. At that time, Arjuna forgot himself and could not understand that he was Arjuna, Krishna's friend, although he was always dependent upon Krishna's mercy. This incident, incident is an example of inferior dependence. Sometimes ghastly activities also support strong ecstatic love for Krishna. This state of mind is called ecstatic fearfulness under illusion. In the 10th canto, 23rd chapter, verse 40 of Srimad Bhagavatam, there's the following statement by the brahmanas who were performing sacrifices. We have all been born into three advantageous conditions. We are in high brahman families, we have ceremoniously received the sacred thread, and we are also properly initiated by a spiritual master. Hmm. But alas, in spite of all these advantages, we are condemned. Even our observance of brahmacharya is condemned. The brahmanas thus began to condemn their own activities. They realized that in spite of being so elevated by birth, education, and culture, they were still under the spell of the illusory energy. They also admitted that even great yogis who are not devotees of the Lord are covered by the influence of the material energy. This kind of hopelessness felt by the brahmanas who are performing ritualistic ceremonies shows practically no attachment for Krishna. There's another hopelessness, however, which shows attachment for Krishna. When the bull demon attacked the damsels of Braja, they began to cry out, Dear Krishna, please save us. We are now gone. This hopelessness, this is hopelessness with attachment for Krishna. When the Keshi demon, that was a horse demon, was assassinated, that's an interesting word, that just used to be killed, by Krishna, Kansa became hopeless. He said, Keshi Daicha, that means the Keshi demon, was as dear to me as my own life, but he has been killed by some coward boy who is crude, uneducated, and ignorant in fighting. Even though I have defeated the king of heaven without difficulty, still I do not know the value of life. Because this hopelessness has a slight touch of attraction for Krishna, it is considered to be a reflection of ecstatic love and hopelessness. Kansa once rebuked Akrura by saying, you are such a fool that you are accepting a coward boy to be the supreme personality of God is simply because he has defeated some harmless water snake. The boy may have lifted one pebble called Govardhan Hill, but what is more surprising than that is your statement that this boy is the personality of Godhead. This is an instance of a maliciously opposing element caused by hopelessness and ecstatic love for Krishna. One devotee tried to console a Kadamba tree when the tree was lamenting because Krishna had not touched even its shadow. We should say that even the trees in Vrindavan can talk are fully conscious, are not in ignorance. It's not bad to take birth in a tree. But in the material world, uh, being a tree means you're in ignorance. And actually, I was listening to something where Prabhupada had just talked about a uh, nudist colony. And he said, if people want to be nude, that means in the next life they're going to be trees and they're going to just have to stand there. And then one devotee, when the devotee asked Prabhupada, but if Krishna wanted us to have clothes, he would have given us clothes. <laughs> Here's the argument, taking the devil's advocate position in relationship to that statement. <laughs> and the answer was, well, if Krishna wanted to give you food, he would have given you food. So you have to work for it. And Prabhupada said, that's the nature of this material world. You have to work for it. In the spiritual world, you don't have to work for anything. There's no work, but here you have to work like a a double -S, s not a double -S, s a double -S, s The devotee said, my dear Kadamba tree, do not be worried. Just after defeating the Kaliya snake in the Yamuna River, Krishna will come and satisfy your desire. This is an instant of inappropriate hopelessness and ecstatic love for Krishna. Guru Da, the eagle, uh, the eagle, the carrier of Vishnu, once said, who can be more pure than I? Where is there a second bird like me, so able and competent? Krishna may not like me. He may not wish to join my party, but still he has to take advantage of my wings. 
This is an instance of hopelessness in the neutral mood of ecstatic love. The symptoms of ecstatic love are sometimes grouped under four headings, namely generation, conjunction, aggregation, and satisfaction. Uh, see how specific Rupa Goswami is getting? I mean, this is beyond our ability to understand. So you don't need to memorize all these things to be Krishna conscious. And obviously, when you preach Krishna consciousness, you're not going to need to know all these different designations and categories and subcategories, but you're going to enjoy and you can appreciate Rupa Goswami's erudition. And this is just a summary study of the Bhakti Rasam into Sindhu. What to speak of the actual Bhakti Rasam into Sindhu, if you read in Sanskrit, it actually gets more complicated than this. Krishna once told Radharani, my dear friend, when you tried to meet me alone in the morning, your friend Mekala remained hungry with envy. Just look at her. When Krishna was joking with Radharani in this way, Radharani moved her beautiful eyebrows crossly. Rupa Goswami prays that everyone may become blessed by this movement of Srimati Radha Rani's eyebrows. This is an instance of the generation of malice and ecstatic love of Krishna. Let me see where we are. See if there's any headings where we can no. We should end right now. Let me just mark the place so we know where to continue tomorrow. All right, one night. Give me one second. Okay, I see. Right, right here, right at the end. Okay, very nice. Okay, so we will take some questions now. Let me stop sharing the screen and allow you to ask questions about anything you wanted to ask about. We're afraid to ask. All right, let me just make sure. Okay, who wants to ask a question? Hare Krishna Guru please accept my humble obeisances. Hey, yes. Krishna Leela. So, what's the question? Uh, just because you mentioned a dream today, um, so just a dream of mine that I just want uh, you to interpret the meaning of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is an important dream. Uh, yeah, since you mentioned that it may mean that uh, a, a spiritual advancement is what you dream about. So I had um, at 3.30 a.m., I saw Srila Prabhupada came in my dream and he came with lots and lots of books with both the hands filled with the books, with the, an act of devotion and all the books. And he's coming to me and he sat down, that, but he picked uh, Bhagavad Gita as is. He's opening the pages and he's just moving his hand like that, page by page, and and he's smiling. Yes, wow. he and he has the orange book in his hand, and I'm sitting there just watching him like that, and he's just moving uh, his hand page by page, and he's smiling at me because he knows uh, my what I'm saying to him. I'm saying, oh no way, no way, no way. I'm just saying that. And he, <laughs> he was very, very funny and smiling. So I just wanted to know what that meant, from, uh, Gurudev. Like and that means you should study Srila Prabhupada's books and try to distribute the knowledge in Srila Prabhupada's books by distributing Srila Prabhupada's books and also teaching people about Krishna consciousness. That's what it means. It's very easy to understand that. And Bring people to Krishna consciousness, but understand Krishna consciousness, cultivate the knowledge. In Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is generally what we call Sambandha Gyan, that is knowledge about the Lord, knowledge about the material energy, knowledge about time, knowledge about karma, and knowledge about the Jiva soul, which is us. So to understand very thoroughly these five topics of the Bhagavad Gita. And the five topics again are the material energy, and that's the main topic in the Bhagavad Gita, which is quite interesting. There's more verses about the material energy, including karma, you know, than any other topic in the Bhagavad Gita. So there's the material energy, uh, there's karma, there's time, see, there's the living entity, the jiva soul, and Ishvara, that's God, for those of you who don't know. So those are the five topics. So you should learn very thoroughly Sambandha Gyan, that's knowledge about those five topics, and then practice very enthusiastically Abhideya Gyan, uh, Sadhana Bhakti, and try to give others Krishna consciousness. And that's really what all of us should be doing. 
So you're very fortunate when you dream about Prabhupada, Prabhupada is actually there. Prabhupada appears to you in your dream. That's very nice. You're very fortunate. By the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, you are very fortunate. So we should all dream of Prabhupada rather than Yamadutas. <laughs> okay, good question. All your blessings, Gurudev. All your blessings. Thank you. So I should bless myself to dream about Prabhupada too. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the Yamadutas. Anyway, so, uh, okay. So, who else wants to ask a question here? Questions. Questions, questions. Nobody. This is your opportunity. And nobody wants to ask a question. Okay, I guess Sita wants to ask a question. Um, sorry, Gurudev, I'm driving also. <laughs> Just a quick one. Um, you mentioned about the de uh, dancing um, in Mangal Aarti. Um, so, um, what about if we are doing the Mangal Aarti? Um, can we sing a bit? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're doing the if you're doing the Mangal Aarti in the temple, that's a good question. Yes, temple. Let me put you, let me put you on mute because there's a lot of noise in the background. If you're doing Mangalarti in the actual temple and there's installed deities there, it's better not to sing because when you sing, then anyway, so many droplets come out. I mean, we're not talking about the virus right now. It's just like uh, the saliva and things in the mouth are generally considered very dirty. Like I, I remember Prabhupada, when uh, people would even touch their mouth or something like that, probably get really disturbed. I mean, actually, uh, there's an interesting story. One time, probably was giving a uh, initiation lecture. It was during the sacrifice, and there was one baby there. The baby kept putting his fingers in his mouth, and Prabhupada said, "Stop! He has contaminated the whole yagya by doing that." So. I've seen Prabhupada, I mean, I, I don't always do that to tell people to stop because I'm a little tolerant and I know that people would get really upset if I kept correcting them like that. And uh, people, are, Kali Yuga has actually progressed, so people are not so, uh, uh, not so used to following instructions anymore. So, but actually when Prabhupada would see someone putting his fingers like in his mouth or rubbing his mouth or anything like that, probably would get very disturbed and say, clean your hands immediately. You know, the prophet was very, very, very careful about cleanliness. Very, very careful about cleanliness. And the prophet said, of course, quoting a uh, common expression is, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. And the prophet said the temple should be revolutionary clean. So anyway, to answer your question, uh, if you're doing deity service in a temple and install deities and there happen to be other devotees there, then bas basically listen to their chanting and then chant in your mind. And as far as dancing, if you're doing deity service, please don't dance while you're doing RT. And <laughs> it's, not a, it's really not a good, good idea. The Bajari is dancing all around the altar. <laughs> doing deity. But if you're not on the altar <coughs> and there's arti, then go wild, dance. Just dance. I mean, to the best of your ability. I mean, some people are trained dancers, like we have this wonderful dancer here, Chapaka, who descended from the spiritual world to dance for Krishna. <laughs> anyway. And yeah, she she basically is just like completely committed to Krishna. She's like one of Krishna's gopis. I mean, it's amazing. So uh, you know, so if you have someone really trained up, then use all your training. And if you're not trained, just go wild. You know, just dance according to your emotions. Just don't hit anybody while you're doing it. At the same time, and then Krishna's pleased. Jump up and down, chant, dance. Just don't stand there like a log. You know, otherwise, it's just, you just stand there 
We're meant to be ecstatic, ecstatic dancing. So, but not if you're the pujari. If you're the pujari, just stand there. Okay. So, who else has a question? Gurudev. Yeah. You had mentioned dreaming about Prabhupada, dreaming about Krishna as an indication of uh, your advancement, but sometimes we see that very, very new devotees, young bhaktas who don't know anything, they have dreams in the beginning that are amazing. And then as they do more devotional service or stay more years <laughs> in the Krishna consciousness movement, those dreams don't come so easily. Why is that? Yeah. Well, two reasons. One is they become complacent. When you first take up Krishna consciousness, it's new, and you're just like, wow, Krishna consciousness, joy, joy. And you become <laughs> fanatic, and you're thinking of Krishna all the time, you're thinking of Prabhupada all the time. It's like when I first joined the movement, I used to uh, wrap my bead bag around my hand and sleep with my bead bag. I would chant myself to sleep, much to the, much to the consternation of the other brahmacharis, because I would wake up in the middle of the night, and that was my sleep chanting. I wake up in the middle of the night and go, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari, Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram. And they, they wake up and say, shut up, <laughs> go back to sleep. So, you know, that was my newbie time in Krishna consciousness. So that's one reason, you know, one is really focused and basically one should always be so focused, but, you know, it's a natural occurrence for people who are newbies. It's the neophyte syndrome. And then another reason is that uh, Prabhupada and Krishna are giving special encouragement to people. I remember even before I joined the movement, here's a, a really deep story you don't want to tell anyone about, because I'm telling everybody, that before I joined the movement, I was deciding whether I actually wanted to join the movement. So I went into the forest, a big deep forest, and I said, I'm going to get lost. And if Krishna is real, he's going to have to guide me out. It's like challenge Krishna like that. And this is a forest with alligators in it and crocodiles and everything like that. It wasn't like your, your, your home forest here in North Carolina. So I went to this deep forest and I was chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, you're going to, let's see, do you want me to join the Hare Krishna movement? So I was chanting, chanting. And... All of a sudden, I had a vision. I'm not saying I'm going to go, but I had a vision of Lord Vishnu with four arms. I did. And then, and about five minutes later, I came to the clearing. And Krishna got me out of the deep forest. And it was the nighttime, you know, it was, get, it was evening. It wasn't completely night, but it was getting really dark, and I would have been really lost in the jungles there. And so Krishna saved me. So I don't do that now. <laughs> now. Now, when I go into the jungle, I have my phone, my GPS. And I just check to see where I am. So instead of taking shelter of Lord Vishnu, I'm taking shelter of, uh, what would it say, uh, Google. So that, that's how my devotional service has gone from Krishna consciousness to Google consciousness at this particular juncture. So, <laughs> so you know, so Krishna gives special mercy in the beginning like that. And I, I met as many stories. I mean, practically every devotee I know has some story like that. And Krishna just like, just convinces you to join. And then after that, Krishna says, you've got to try harder. With Narada Muni, the same, a similar thing happened. When Narada Muni's mother passed away, he was wandering through all the jungles and the cities and everything like that. And then Krishna appeared to him, Lord Vishnu appeared to him, and he said, here's the only time you're going to see me, buddy. Unless you're completely pure, you know, that's it. So based upon that one experience that Narada Muni had, and that was just one experience, one vision during his whole lifetime, that was the impetus which drove him to really, you know, be absorbed in Krishna consciousness as he was wandering everywhere. Little boy, just wandering everywhere. And then in his next life, he took uh, birth or appeared 
to be more precise, as the great Narada Muni with a spiritual body. So Krishna does have that habit, and Prabhupada and pure devotees do have that habit of giving us some impetus in the beginning uh, to remain Krishna conscious or enthuse us or to give us some direction. Uh, but after some time, you know, Krishna makes you work harder for the, uh, for the dreams. You know, especially, especially if you happen to be a guru and you initiate people, then you definitely have some interesting dreams. And that had always about Krishna. So there, I, you know, I remember after the last initiation, I had a dream about Donald Trump. You know, that was a karmic reaction. <laughs> it was like the biggest nightmare I ever had. I would prefer Dracula, Godzilla, Wolfman, or whatever it is, rolled into one. Anyway, so on that happy note, I think we're going to end. Now it's always good to end on a little humor in our classes. Okay, we'll see you all, all tomorrow. All glories to His Divine Grace, Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada, Ki Jai.